So I just want to stop and uh, take your questions at this point. Uh, if you've got any. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, in, in India, when you were doing your work there, how could you have improved what you were doing by not being a vocational Christian in that situation? Okay. Yeah, he asked when I was in, in India, how could I have improved my situation? effectiveness by not being a vocational Christian worker. Well, the reality was I wasn't a vocational Christian worker. I was kind of a, I was kind of a hybrid. Yes, I was, I was being paid to be there, but while I was there, I also had work. The access was through work, and people saw me as a businessman. Everywhere I go, they see me as a businessman. Now, again, we're kind of looking at two separate issues. There are times, you look at the ministry of Paul, you will find there were times when the church supported him and moved him places. But then you also see times like in Ephesus when he settled down into a company in business and he stayed the longest in Ephesus. And there he had the tent making business and you see other people involved in that business and you see a huge part of Paul's ministry connects back to Ephesus. If you haven't connected all the Ephesus issues in the, in the New Testament, it's an interesting study. So, yeah, there's a place where we might want to send someone, we might want to pay for that, we might want to get them started, but really, for them to get into the community and work, they may have to be a school teacher. They may have to be a professor. They may have to be a businessman. Those are the ones we see that are, that are more successful and, and work in, in more places. I did a lot of consulting when I was in India with businesses, including banks and, and other places. And so uh, out of my programming background and, and, and uh, doing software and those kind of things. But... There is a place for vocational, but when it gets down to the grassroots level where you're touching lostness, not just looking at access, not looking at strategy. My job's a strategist now. I have to look at the big picture. But when I get down there and I'm in the dirt, in the trenches, at that point, your identity is very, very important to the lost people around you. And you have to develop a real identity. It can't be a cover identity. Uh, one of the problems we've seen in business's mission in the past is that it's been a failing business identity or an identity that really wasn't successful. The people kept pouring donor money into it to, to prop up this business, and it was a false <coughs> a cover. People see through that. Governments see through that. Local people see through that. They can tell you're not making money. Where is this guy getting his money? He's certainly not selling enough shirts to make that money. So that, that brings suspicion. That brings all kinds of problems to you. So it's really important that even if I go in as a venture into an area, I describe myself. I'm here to try something. I do have some donation, donor, donor capital or I have capital coming in to help me, venture capital. Um, I've got 18 months. If I can't make this work, I want to be gone because I've got to make it work in 18 months and, and work to, to make it happen. So. That, that's a great question, and uh, the answer is I was already identified as a person from the outside there to establish businesses, and we have established businesses in India. Other questions? Yeah? A related question along the same lines of using uh, small for-profit businesses. Do you ever see that um, it, you can get a case where the tail starts wagging the dog, so to speak, and that business starts becoming successful, and it really draws people away from any Christian ministry or something. I mean, they would say, oh, I've got to focus on this, and they lose their interest in salt and light. You see that? Is there times when the business becomes so successful that it actually becomes a hindrance to the church planning process? That is always a possibility, and so you have to plan for it up front. And one of the ways we plan for it is making sure that on our board of directors there is someone with real power that can call us back to our real purpose and has as much ability to hire and fire and change the direction of the company as any other board member, but their responsibility for being on the board or their responsibility for being in the leadership of the company is to keep us reminded of why we have this company and why we're doing that. And we're going to make good business decisions but we're not going to make good business decisions at the expense of the real reason or the, the other reason that we're here. And, and there's always going to be a tension there. I was with a company, one of the companies I worked with in India uh, was making conveyor belts for the mining industry. Uh, now, breaking into business in India with, the, with the business ethics and all in India is tough, tough, 
tough, tough, tough. My position on the board of that company was to keep the owners and the investors focused on what their purpose was and to help them strategize in how they were going to reach their employees, how they were going to build relationships with their customers, and how they were going to do other things in a broader circle that, that ranged around this company. And this, this turned out to be, you know, like a $15 million company and doing great business. And it, every day it was a tension to say, you know, guys fighting against you saying, I don't have time for that. I said, look, five minutes. I'm asking you five minutes to spend time with your employees talking about spiritual matters. That was my job, just to remind them the time, the time, the time. And that's part of, part of the, the solution. It's a problem. Our job as leaders is to what? Solve problems, right? That's what we do. So we put in the mechanisms that help us meet those kind of issues. Uh, could you use the Safe Water Projects to illustrate some of the CPM principles in a practical way? Safe Water, the yeah, can we use the Safe Water Projects to illustrate some of these examples in church planting? Uh, let, let's start with a kind of an unusual one, uh, maybe not so unusual. Tsunami hit several years ago. We all remember tsunami. In southern part of India, in Nagapatna, was a, was a whole area that was devastated. All their wells were salted, no fresh water. We went into that area and provided water at no charge. Bought tanker trucks, bought water, trucked that water in. Set up distribution points and, and gave away water until the area began to get economically back on its feet again. When it moved into economic possibilities, we talk to local people and say, look, we can't keep giving water. Well, we don't have any wells. We understand you don't have any wells, but we've got to move this from being a, a donation process to being a utility. And we talked with the government, we talked with the local people, and we, over a period of time, moved it from being a, a donation dis, uh, recovery process, disaster relief process, to being a water utility for this region and began to charge for the, began to charge for the water, uh, began to hire people to operate the equipment. We began to buy wells and sink wells further inland so that we could get the water at a different cost than buying it from the local market and turned it into a business. It's making money. It's supporting uh, workers. Our, all the workers in the business are church planters also. And, and that whole process started out as a relief project that moved into a business project that now is a growing successful business that we tend to continue to develop and grow further and further. So water is one of the greatest needs on the planet. I mean, there are some people that are saying before long, water will cost more than gasoline. And that, that just boggles my mind because I use a whole lot more water than I use gasoline and the gasoline prices are scaring me already. If I start paying $4 a gallon for water, I, I'm, I'm in big trouble. I think most of us are. But that's the reality. The, the, the potable water available on our planet is limited. And to, to clean up the stuff we polluted is going to be expensive. And our populations keep growing. And, and half of all the children who die under five, the age of five now are dying from waterborne diseases. I mean, we've got all these issues. Every community has these issues. Every community on the planet are going to have water issues. What a better place to do business, to get in contact with people who have need and do it right. Yes? Well, one of your guidelines was you don't do personal evangelism. Can mm -hmm. you say a little bit more about that? I presume when you're looking for the leader in that new community, you are doing personal evangelism one-on-one? -on -one? Depends on what you, how you're defining personal evangelism. How, say you don't do personal evangelism, then how do you do it? Our job, our job is to find the person in the community who is receptive to new spiritual ideas. Personal evangelism is about converting them to Christianity. So we have a different job. My job is not to convert anyone. My job is to find the person God has prepared to receive his gospel. That's my job. That's a very different job than personal evangelism. Now, once I find the person that God has prepared to receive his gospel, I begin to facilitate them in listening to God, discovering God. It's a guided study. 
I want them to discover that God created everything. I want them to discover that God is everywhere. I want them to discover that God is all powerful. I want them to discover that God knows everything. I want them to discover that God is holy, is without sin. I want them to discover that God cannot tolerate sin. I want them to discover that every person does sin. The consequences for that sin is separation from God, and God will judge those who have sinned, but He has provided a way for us to be forgiven of those sins. But I'm not going to do that in a personal evangelism style. I'm going to do that in a discovery style that involves his group of influence, whether it's a family or employees or friends or neighbors. It's going to be done in a discovery process, and I'm going to let God speak to them through his word. And they will come to a point when they say, oh my, we're lost. And they may not use that, those words, but that's what they'll discover. And then we keep saying, what's God's provision for this? And we begin to present the provision. It sounds slow. I mean, this is not the four spiritual laws. This is not EE. This is not wind. This is not continuous. It's not any of those things. It's not the Roman road. It is an engagement in a relationship that is spiritual that takes someone from not knowing God to falling in love with God to giving their life to Christ in obedience living. And that takes a relationship and takes time. Yes, sir. Um, question on the same uh, thought as the last question. Um, some examples of personal evangelism might be uh, giving out tracts at a restaurant, uh, giving out tracts at a, uh, uh, a fair, or knocking on doors and giving out tracts and invitations to churches. Is that what you're saying basically is personal evangelism, or is that too, too finite? Yeah, giving out tracts and doing those kind of things is, is, is certainly a part of traditional personal evangelism. We do none of those things. I can't remember the last time I gave a tract to anyone, and I certainly don't train anyone to give tracts. Uh, I don't train on knocking on doors. We don't do knocking on doors. Um, kind of give you an example. We had, a, we had a village that was extremely resistant, not just to the gospel, but to any outsiders. I mean, they were resistant. And every evangelist that had tried to go to that area basically hit a block, block wall when they got to this village. And they would literally run you out of town with machetes. And so one of, our, one of the guys that had been there was in a market, and he saw a lady he recognized from that village. And, he said, and it was like 15 kilometers away, about 10 miles. And he said, why are you here? He says, well, we don't have a market. I've got to come here anytime I want anything. And he said, does everyone in your village come here? He says, yeah, it's horrible. He says, you know, we, we spend a whole day walking here, buying stuff, and then carrying it back to the village. And he came to me and says, I know how we can get into that village. He says, we can open a market there. I said, well, you know, I don't have any money to open a market. That's expensive. <laughs> So, but what we can do, why don't we get you a bicycle and you buy some staples, rice, sugar, tea, coffee, plastic ware, and you go to the village and say, hey, I'm here if you would like to buy these things, come buy them. Well, the first few times he would come out and they'd buy them, and then he said, give me orders, I'll, I'll buy whatever you want. So he'd go back, next day he'd come back and more stuff. And he charged just a little variance for, for the portage from, from the market to where they lived, and they were happy to pay it because it was spread out over a lot of people. And all of a sudden, this guy had a pretty good business, and he, he got a partner to come with him. And before long, they, they weren't coming outside the village. They said, well, why don't you just come on in the village and deliver this stuff? And so he started going into the village and began to move around from house to house. Well, as he began to move around from house to house, he started talking about spiritual matters. Isn't this a beautiful day God has made for us today? They look at him, well, that's a strange greeting. What do you mean by that? He says, well, I believe God made everything. And even today, he, he made it and gave to us. And soon people started talking to him about spiritual matters. And over the course of time, he went from just being the guy who delivered plastic and tea to being the guy who brought the gospel. And now the, the village has a church, and over half the church, over half the villagers are in that church, a part of that body of believers. So that's what, that's what we talk about as evangelism. If I had tried to go to that place with tracks, I would have never gotten past the front gate. Uh, it's interesting. I, I, I used to do track bombing. That's what we call it. We go through places and just, just give tracks everywhere. 
and I was, I was down in Columbia, and we went through Village Square down there, and, and we were handing out all these tracts, and, and it was interesting. We started on one side of the square. When we got to the other side of the square, a police car pulled up, and he arrested us for littering. <laughs> and we had to go back into the square and pick up all the tracks that people had thrown down after we'd given them to them. And, that was, and, and basically, hey, will you find anyone who came to Christ through a track? Of course you will. But how many millions of tracks were given out for each person who came to Christ through one? Is it an efficient way of doing it? Th those are some of the questions I'm asking. And that's what I'm trying to help us to see is that, yeah, I, I know guys who, who wit whose their goal is, I'm going to do a personal witness to 10 people every day. Do they win people to Christ? Of course they do. But on what percentage? One out of 100? One out of 500? That's probably the kind of percentages we're looking at. Well, you know, out of what we do, we're seeing millions come to Christ that would have never listened to a personal testimony and would have never accepted a track or a Bible. And that's part of what you here in the, in the Bay Area, particularly Silicon Valley, are people going to accept tracks from you and is it going to be meaningful to them? What's the greatest single felt need of an immigrant, a, guy, a worker who's come to work in the Silicon Valley, whether he's legal or undocumented? Felt need is English. Felt need is loneliness. Loneliness. You start dealing with meeting the loneliness of these people and meet that felt need and become a real friend. I don't become a friend of someone in order to win them to Christ. I become a friend of someone because Christ commanded me to do it. And if they're going to be my friend, they're going to get to know who I am at my heart's level. And when they get to know who I'm at my heart's level, I've got to share who I am spiritually. And when I share who I am spiritually, I'm going to begin sharing with them from the Word of God. I've got a whole series of what I call micro Bible studies or water cooler Bible studies. I say, you know, I learned something interesting from God today. I stop right there. Never go past that point until you receive permission to do so. I learned something interesting from God today, and then I just go on. And You know, it's interesting how often somebody come back and slide up beside me and say, what did you learn? They just gave me permission. Well, I was reading where it says that God knows my every thought. And I realized, man, that's scary. There's some things I think I don't want anybody to know, and I certainly don't want God to know it, but he already knows it. What do you think about that? And that's all it is. It's just bringing up a question, bringing up an idea. And if you do that every day with people you work with, with clients, just that one 30-second little piece of the gospel, in the course of six months to a year, how much are you going to cover out of the gospels? Now, do you call that personal evangelism? Well, maybe it is. But I'm not trying to force anything. I said, I discovered something about God today. I learned something new today. Or I found something out today. And then they ask me. I don't ever tell them until they ask. And then that shows if they're not interested, they're not going to ask, are they? So if I told them and they're not interested, I'm wasting my breath. Remember that principle? Don't share the gospel with people unless they're interested in it. And, but it's interesting. In the course of a day, most of us will contact about 200 people in the course of living our day. If you did that with 200 people and even 1% of them began to engage you at a spiritual level, that's two new people every day. Over the course of the year, that's 700 people. How many of those are going to come to Christ? Even if 1% of them come to Christ, that's seven people. How many of you led seven people to Christ this year using traditional personal evangelism methodologies. See, the, the, the whole thing, it's, it's about a life. Church planting isn't an event. It's a lifestyle. I'm always a church planter. Whether I'm driving to the airport or sitting in a restaurant or talking with a guy I just hit with my car, 
I'm always going to be a church planter, and I'm going to live those things out right there. And when I make mistakes, I'm going to come back and say, you know, last night when I was praying to God, I was convicted of what I said to you yesterday. And I asked God to forgive me, and He did. I know He did, but you know, it's not done until I ask you to forgive me. Will you forgive me for what I said yesterday? Do you know of anyone that that would offend if you did that? But look at what you just said. I believe in God. I talk to God. I confess my sin to God. God forgives my sin, and I make it right with others. Sounds like the gospel to me. <laughs> and yet we make mistakes, and what do we do? I don't want to ever see that person again. And yet it might be the perfect time to see that person again if you deal with it in a spiritual way instead of a human way. That's what being a church planter is about, is getting excited about doing things God's way instead of our way. And we can't know how to do it God's way unless we're studying His Word, and we're in it, and we're praying about it, and we're talking to other people about it. Think of how it would change your churches if we lived it. Think of how it would change your family if we live it. And I'm telling you, it'll impact our communities if we live it. We just don't believe it, so we don't live it. If you believe something, you do it. The proof is, most Christians don't believe the Bible because they never do it. We say we believe it, but we don't act it out. Other questions? Yeah, over here, right here. When you're doing the discovery method, are you going sequentially through the Bible? Are you going through needs? How are you deciding on these groups? Yeah, when we're doing the Discovery Bible study, how do we decide? We've actually set up a group of Discovery Bible systems and, and, and they're guided discoveries. We're not, it's not random. So, for instance, if I know I'm dealing with a, a Hindu background person, I've got a set of discoveries to help them deal with their worldview and help them discover who Christ is and, and who God is. If I'm dealing with an executive, it's going to be a different set. Now, the core is going to be the same, but I'm still going to deal with some worldview issues around that that are different. Uh, when they become a believer, I've got a set of discoveries in obedience. How, now that I'm a believer, what am I responsible and accountable for to God? And I don't want to tell them. Matter of fact, in our teams, we, when, when someone's made a mistake, I never go and point my finger in their face and say, you've made a mistake and you've done this wrong, you've done that wrong, and now you're in big trouble. We don't do that. Now, strangely enough, when I invite a team member to come to my house for a Bible study, they know they're in big trouble. <laughs> oh, no, David's invited me for a Bible study. And, and I want to say, you know, we're, we're going to look at, we're going to look at uh, this passage, and we're going to do a three-column. And the passage is going to deal with the problem. I know it is, and they know it is. And when we've gotten through it, we're going to, we're going to say, okay, what does the Scripture say? What has God said to us? What are we going to do? And we don't end the meeting until they tell me what they're going to do. Because they're in relationship to me, an, accountable, an accountability relationship, whether it's in business or in, in church planting or in family relationship. Those are, those are the things we do. So, yes, it's not random. Sometimes it is chronological, particularly in, in one of the things new believers need to learn is the life of Christ. So we will do a chronological study through the life of Christ. And uh, we also do a chronological study of the history developing who, from, from creation to Christ. That is chronological and done chronologically. Yeah, I'm going to end down here. Um, over time, say you have these thousands of churches in India. As they mature, do they develop regional fellowships? Or how do they, how do they come together? Are they just isolated groups and villages? Or do they form a quote, denomination? Or what do they do? What happens? Right. As, as these thousands of churches come into existence, we encourage them because we have meetings that invite them to come and meet together, but we don't give them form. But they naturally develop form around their own social structures, around their own interest, around those kind of things. So in the India context, we have one meeting a year where we invite all the churches. And, and they come and, you know, we have thousands of people there and lots of different groups. But... The rest of the year, they're in small associations. Some of them stay completely independent. They don't associate with anyone else. Some of them associate with 
uh, the people they went to leadership training seminars with, they, they continue that association. Some of them develop strong leaders who will put together a denomination, and there's literally hundreds of those denominations now that weren't there 10 years ago. But we don't try to control that. We see our job as church starters, not church developers. And our job is to, to set them out on the path of obedience and then how they form themselves, how they govern themselves, and all those kind of things come out of their context. Now, I promise you, existing structures and organizations often come in and say, you're doing it all wrong and you got to do it this way. And they, some of our guys will listen to that, then they realize that's not a very good idea and they jump out of, the, out of that. But uh, it happens all the time. Yes, sir? Uh, just kind of follow up. At what point in this church planning process do you qualify and point elders? Uh, we don't. We, we equip leaders, and they read the word, and when they come to that process, they choose how they're going to do it, and they qualify it, and they do it locally. We don't do it from an outside. Well, oh, how, how do you qualify leaders and appoint elders and those kinds of things? We just don't do that. They do that on their own. We, we really try not to impose any kind of structure that is not from, from an outside tradition onto them. Yeah? There's an Internet question where they ask... Uh, we come in and we find those who are ready to receive the gospel. Do we play any role for what happens in preparing them to be ready to receive the gospel? What is, do we have any? Yeah, our role is a facilitator in studying the word of God. The, our, our, our role in this whole process is catalytic. Catalytic means I'm required for the process to happen, but then the final product, I'm no longer there. The catalyst is totally recoverable and it, it's no longer a part of the final product. So I'm absolutely essential in the church planting process, but I'm catalytic. I get it going, I speed it up, I make it happen in places where it wouldn't happen, but as it begins to become itself, then I don't need to be there anymore. And what I've imparted to them is an absolute desire to know the mind and heart of God from His Word and to be obedient to it, and to conform all of my practices to the Word of God as the Holy Spirit reveals it and interprets it to me. So literally we talk about Scripture. That's where we start with Scripture. And then out of Scripture, we're going to look at practice coming from that without an intermediate coming into it and and, and that's that's what we want to want to do